find ourselves in the book of Amos, chapter Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight, the opportunity to have your word speak into our lives. And God, we just open our heart because we want to understand your heart after us. And we want to have your word just minister life. And so, God, we know that these words are words of revival. And that's our very heart. We desire revival also. So, Lord, touch each one of us tonight by your Holy Spirit. Each one of us, touch us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Going through the book of, of Amos here. And again, the minor prophets, it's important to establish that they're not minor prophets because they're minor in significance, only smaller in regards to their size, but filled with prophecy and significant calls to revival. Over and over, the Lord is calling to revival. And why does he do that? Because he cares. He wants revival. And even though uh, they were turning their back on the Lord and going wayward and going after so many things, he, he didn't relent. He just kept going after them, sending one prophet, prophet after the other, knocking on the door of their heart to get them to turn around. And Amos is another one. It tells us in verse 1, chapter 1, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders, from Tekoa. So right away we know his, he's a shepherd, like David was a shepherd. Uh, Tekoa is uh, just a little valley that's between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. So if you go directly uh, toward the east and somewhat south, there would be the little valley where Tekoa would be. And he says this is the vision that he envisioned concerning Israel. So Israel would be the northern kingdom. Remember, it's divided north and south at this point. So even though he's from the south area of Judah, the vision is about basically, mostly about the north. You'll see what happens here. In the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. This would be just before Isaiah's time. And Uzziah was, in many ways, a good king. Uh, and, and Israel uh, really saw great prosperity under Uzziah. Uh, he was an interesting person. Uh, he actually was a bit of an inventor. And so he invented various different uh, um, modernizations, of course, for that time, modernizations of war, and advanced Israel in many different ways. And they saw uh, prosperity and good times. Um, but good times can be dangerous. And material wealth can sometimes cause people to be spiritually bankrupt. And so here's really a, a part of the message. It's time of Uzziah. And it was also in the days of Jeroboam. He was the king up in the north. That was Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And it marks uh, an interesting thing. This was two years before the earthquake. Everyone knew about the earthquake at the time because it was absolutely uh, memorable. It was a huge earthquake. And in fact, it's mentioned in uh, um, Zechariah. It's also mentioned in Isaiah. So uh, it was marked well. And so this kind of puts the time frame actually probably around about 800 uh, B.C. or so. So this is the vision. He goes on in verse 2. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion. There's a picture of God roaring out of Zion. And from Jerusalem, he utters his voice. Now, that right there uh, should capture their attention because up in the north, uh, the kings up in the north didn't want the people going to Jerusalem for worship. And so they set up these idols, you know, in, in Bethel and far up there in the north in Dan, these golden calf altars. And uh, they started mixing in uh, Judaism with the, the religions of the other uh, uh, nations around them. And they had this, this, this compromised hybridization of weird religion. And uh, it wasn't a heart after God at all. It was a mixture, but a terrible mixture. You don't mix all that nonsense with, with any kind of sense of God and come out with anything reasonable. And that's really part of the problem. So the Lord roars out of Zion. And by the way, that's a picture also of the end times. Because the Lord, Zechariah is going to make clear, 
the Lord will come and set foot on the Mount of Olives and enter into Jerusalem, and he will roar from Jerusalem again. As that's his point. The Lord roars from Zion, from Jerusalem. And the shepherd's pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. Carmel is, that, uh, of course, that great place, the mountain in the northwest part of Israel, where there is a great contest between uh, uh, God, Yeshua, and the prophets of Baal. So he goes on, verse 3, Thus says the Lord. Now he uses a phrase over and over here, and it says, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four. So he uses this for three transgressions and for four, kind of over and over. And he doesn't tell us uh, what all four are necessarily, but he gives us the capstone, the worst of it. And the whole idea is the, the cup of the wrath of God's filled up here. All right, that's the point. So for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I'm not going to revoke its punishment. Because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. Gilead uh, is on the other side of the Jordan, but it was God's people. And so, in fact, there's a, a psalm that says, Gilead is mine. And so this is an offense against God's people. And he goes on to say, verse 4, So I'm going to send on their head, back on them, I'm going to send fire upon the house of Hazael, and it will consume the citadels of Ben-Hadad <clears throat> up in the north, up in the area of Syria. And uh, you might remember when we were going through the, the prophets that Elijah, after that great contest on Mount Carmel, uh, Jezebel, the wicked Jezebel, threatened him. And uh, even though he was a mighty man of God, he took the fear into his heart and he ran. He ran way, way south and kind of hid himself. And there God said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he started kind of, you know, bemoaning, oh, I alone am left, and, you know, the prophets have died. And Get up. Get up and go. And he said, go anoint Haziel. <clears throat> so he actually, I'm commissioning you. Get up and do what I've called you to do. So he goes up to the north, and he actually, uh, when he does it, he begins to weep. What is this? Because God has shown me what tragedies you're going to do. Oh, do you think I'm a dog? But he did it. He did them all. And it goes on. So therefore, I'm going to break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the valley of Avon and hold him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. So the people of Aram, this is the area of Syria, will go exiled to Kir. That's in Assyria. Of course, the Assyrian army is going to come, and you know the story of the defeat of the north. So it's a prophecy well before it ever happened. Verse 6, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. Now Gaza, now he's going south along the area along the coast, the south coast. Uh, if you look at your map today, it would be called the Gaza Strip. And so this was, in that time, um, possession of the Philistines, the mortal enemies of Israel, the Philistines. So he mentions here, they deported an entire population and delivered it up to Edom. So again, an offense against the people of Israel. When they attacked and had defeated some villages, they took the village people and just deported them wholesale and sold them over to Edom. He said, this is offensive. God is offended because of, these are his people. So I'm going to send fire upon the wall of Gaza, and it will consume her citadels, and I'll cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod. He's going to mention four out of the major five cities. Ashdod, and him who holds the scepter from Ashkelon, and I will even unleash my power upon Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines will perish, says the Lord. Now, that's an interesting prophecy. In other words, there will be no Philistines left. You will not find any Philistines today, which is interesting fulfillment of that prophecy. You might say, well, wait a minute. I think I, think I remember in the news hearing something about the Palestinians. Aren't they, aren't they the Philistine people of old? Not even close. 
They are not Philistine people. Just a quick little tutorial. Uh, and by the way, I give this every year in the summer class that I teach called The History of Our Palestinian Problem. Uh, I encourage you to, to go to that if you have an interest in how we got to the point that we're at in the Middle East today. It's a very important history. But it's important here just to take note that the name Palestine was given to that area uh, by the Romans who wanted to offend Israel. And so they took it over by, as you know, they had control. And so at some point, they just simply said, you know what? We're so tired of these Jewish people. We're going to name this area after their hated enemy. We're going to call it Palestine after the Philistines. And so thus it was named for many, many years. And so uh, with all of the events that happened in the early 1900s, uh, the, the people began to be called that area of Palestine. The people became Palestinians. All right, more on that in the summer class. You want to go to it. And he goes on. Um, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre, or Tyre, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. All right, now we're back along the coast, but up along the north, Tyre was a major, I mean, it was a major, major city. I mean, ships were coming in and out of that uh, and bringing imports and exports from Europe, from, you know, the area of Italy and Greece and Africa. I mean, it was a major wealth center. And so here's his problem, he says, the transgressions of Tyre, and, and he says, they delivered up an entire population to Edom. They did a very similar thing, but they didn't remember the covenant of brotherhood. Well, going back in your history, you might remember that the, the king of Tyre, which is named Hiram, was a friend of David's, and they had a covenant together. And in fact, uh, in that area around Tyre, were some fantastic cedars. The cedars of Lebanon were well known, just famous. And uh, so uh, the king, Hiram, friend of David, uh, provided cedar for David's house. For three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. Because he pursued his brother with the sword. Now this is really interesting. His brother, who are we talking about? What brother are we referring to? Israel. Edom is another word for the descendants of Esau. Remember that Esau and Jacob were twins. So these are like brothers. And so he says, there's something wrong here with this picture. You pursued your brother with the sword while he stifled his compassion, his anger tore continually, and he maintained his fury forever. So I'll send fire upon Taman, and it will consume the citadels of Bozra. What does this mean? It means like, hey, do you remember the story of Jacob and Esau and the enmity between them and the animosity between them, God had prophesied that the older would serve the younger. The promise, God gets to choose through whom his promise will come. And he said it's going to come from the younger. He is the son of promise. And so hearing that, the, uh, Rebecca at some point decided to do a little bit of manipulation to make that promise happen on her own. That manipulation wasn't exactly appreciated. And so Esau was so infuriated that he, he set out to kill uh, Jacob, who had to run for his life, and he you know, ran to his uncle Laban. You know the story. 
And then uh, after many years, actually, he met his match with Laban. He was a manipulator of manipulators. That was what he deserved, to go deal with Laban for a while. And, uh, you know, he got his wives and uh, came down and uh, met God at Bethel. And so it's a beautiful story, but the animosity between the brothers remains. And the whole point here is, man, how long are you going to hold on to this? this is, he says, look, he maintained his fury forever. Like, so the people, here's, here's, get this point. So the people of Edom, they held the grudge of their father one generation after the other. Are you telling me you're still holding on to that grudge all these years later? And to the point that you, every time that, that Israel would get attacked from the north, they'd take advantage and attack from the south. What are you doing? You're going to hold on to this anger of yours, this bitterness of yours forever? Now, I'll tell you what, this is a good word for us. Now, he's talking about nations, but frankly, it's a good word for all of us because there's a lot of people who do the very same thing. Holding on to bitternesses and unforgiveness for how long are you going to hold on to that? But I want to say it with compassion and grace. Oh, somebody's unhappy. With some compassion and grace. Because God is saying to you, you know what? If you would let go of that, it'd bless your life. When you hold on to that bitterness, when you hold on to that unforgiveness all those years, you're the one who pays. You're the one who suffers. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you. I want you to be blessed. I want you to have peace. I want you to have joy in your heart. Don't let this thing rob you. Don't be robbed. Have the blessing of God in its fullness on your life. Amen. He goes on. By the way, the... the Maybe perhaps most famous Edomite would be Herod the Great. You might not know, but he was actually an Edomite, an Edomian. And so after him uh, and his descendants, it, they disappeared also from the face of the earth. Verse 13, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the sum of Ammon, and for four, Ammon would be directly east across the Jordan River and that area right east on the Jordan. Today it's called Jordan. And if you change the pronunciation to Amman, which is the capital of Jordan, you know exactly the area we're talking about. But there's no Ammonites there. They're Arabs. So he goes on. Because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead. That's just despicable. I'm sorry. That's just despicable. And these are the people of God. Gilead is mine. And he says, now, you did it to enlarge your borders. That's interesting. Some things don't seem to change. If you look at what's happening in the Middle East today, it's kind of the same theme. You're trying to enlarge your, your borders. And interestingly, you might know some of your history, the, the Jordanian uh, uh, people, government, actually did enlarge their borders when 1948, May 14th, 1948, when David Ben-Gurion declared the independent state of Israel, the six Arab nations around them immediately declared war. So within minutes of their declaring that they were a state, they were under attack by six Arab nations. And Jordan took the opportunity to press across the Jordan, took the entire West Bank and Jerusalem, and annexed it, which was... Later, in 1967, during the Six-Day War, it was all taken back. And Israel, once again, had control of the West Bank. But it's an interesting bit of history when you kind of connect it to some of the things that are happening today. Verse 14, So I will kindle a fire on the wall of Rabbah, and will consume her citadels amid war cries on the day of battle and a storm on the day of tempest. Their king will go into exile, he and his princes together, says the Lord. And this, of course, happened. They were destroyed. The Ammonite people are no more. And it's interesting when you go over this chapter because all of these are offenses against the people of Israel. 
All of these are offenses against the people of Israel. And it's interesting because you might remember there is a prophecy, there's a scripture in Genesis 12, 3, which says, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Now, I'm not sure where you stand, but let me tell you where I stand. I'm convinced that that scripture is relevant even today. And I believe that one of the most important positions that America can ever take is to support Israel. And I think that to turn our backs on Israel is to invite disaster. But I'm afraid to report that's kind of what's happening today. More than ever in, since 1948, America is more and more turning their back on Israel. And I think that that is a foreboding of danger. I know where you are. That's where I am. And it goes on, you know, and by the way, when you think about that, it's, we kind of have that same mentality. You know, it's like, hey, my children, I protect my children. You know, and God has the same heart. These are my children, I protect my children. Now, sometimes my children can be naughty. Sometimes my children can misbehave. But it's up to me to discipline my children. You don't touch my children. Isn't that kind of the idea? That's the same idea. Chapter 2. Thus says the Lord... For three transgressions of Moab and for four. So we're moving still across the Jordan, but a little more north. Because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. Like, what, what despicable things. So I will send fire on Moab, and it will consume the citadels of Kiriath, and Moab will die amid tumult. With war cries, sound of trumpet. I will also cut off the judge from her midst and slay her princes with him, says the Lord. There's no Ammonites today either. Verse 4, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah. All right, now he looks to Judah. But it's an interesting thing because he says, they rejected the law of the Lord. Didn't say anything about the law of the Lord in regards to those other nations. It had to do with their treatment of Israel and their law uh, the, the, the laws of right and wrong, a moral law. But here he says, no, it's about the law of the Lord. You've rejected it. And I was mentioning this on the weekend uh, in, as we're going through Romans. The place that we need to be is being in subjection to the truth. Hey, God, you gave your truth. I will take hold of your truth. Faith comes from listening, from heeding, from opening your heart to the word. That's where faith comes from. That's how faith is increased. When you close your heart to the word, faith decreases and will be actually diminished to the point where without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you want to please God, faith is the key. Relationship is the answer. The whole point of Jesus dying on the cross is that we might have a way to have relationship to the holy, righteous God through Jesus Christ, his son. Glorious. And see, he gives us this word here about they rejected the law of the Lord. They've not kept his word, his statutes. Interesting phrase. Their lies have led them astray. Hmm. Their lies have led them astray. I tell you what, we live in a day where lies pervade the culture. There are, lies pervade the world. And this is why Jesus spoke about the significance of the truth. He said, if you abide in my word, it means dwell there, stay there, live there, soak in it. If you abide in my word, then truly your disciples of mine. In other words, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, he said, this is the key. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, then you soak in his word. You dwell in his word. And he said, because then you will know the truth. Well, it's important to remember that Jesus says, I am the truth. So really, when you're soaking in his word, what you're doing is that you're getting to know him. He is that word of God. He is that truth. Truth is a person, is my point. And therefore, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It will have an impact on your life, spiritually speaking. So he has this really interesting point in verse 4. Their lies led them astray. Those after which their fathers walked. Their fathers lived on those lies. Break it. Your father lived on those lies. 
Time to break it. Now, that may be very important to you, but it's very important to me. My father, as I was growing up, you know my story, alcoholic, abusive, and I saw all the things that was going on in his life. But I, I believe that God gave me an insight. I, I had faith from an early age, uh, 11, I guess that's early. I started to grow in my faith, and as I observed him and watched his ways, I had an insight, and I began to understand that he was living according to what he learned from his father and what he learned from his culture and time. And that was the way uh, many men were in those days. And I began to see and observe. And something happened in me where I felt the Lord was saying, and it's going to end right here. It's going to end right here. You do not have to take this on. You do not have to carry that baton. You don't have to carry that mantle on your life. It can end, and it can end right here. And I praise God that it ended right here. And we can move on. And I want to say that to you because I don't know, maybe you're carrying something around from your father. You don't have to carry that with you. Why can't it end right now? Why can't it end with this? Why can't it end with you? Don't carry that stuff that you got from your dad. Let go of that stuff and have a new dad. This was the great revelation that I had when God says, listen, I understand all your hurt and your brokenness, but listen, I'll be your father. I'll be a father that no father on earth could ever be to you, and I'll heal your heart, and I'll be your strength, and I'll bless your life, and I'll order your steps. Let me be your father. I'll tell you what, that was the day my life changed. That was the day my life changed. Don't live by the lies that your father lived by anymore. Be set free. Be set free. He goes on. Verse 6. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel. All right, now he's kind of drawn a big circle around a bullseye, and now he's going to go right after Israel. And that's really the thrust of his book. Israel, because they sell the righteous for money. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. Something about the heart of the Lord. Don't touch his children. That's, that's one word. But he looks after the poor and the needy. Don't start taking advantage of the poor and needy because God's going to be offended at that. For example, he says, you look after the orphan and the widow. In, in fact, I... That's my heart. You, listen, you see throughout the scriptures from beginning to end, that's his heart. You look after the orphan and the widow. If you want my heart into your heart, you look after the orphan and the widow. You take care of the underprivileged. You watch out for the needy. You make sure that you're concerned about the poor because that's the heart that God wants. You say, well, why is that so important? Because God is a God of compassion and he wants us to have a heart of compassion. The problem with too many people today, of course, is that they're living in a self-centered world with self-centered motives, and it's all about self and building up their own self and the things for self. Well, we don't have to live just like the world lives either. We can have the heart of God, and he says, I have compassion. I want you to have compassion. That's why he says, you, you be careful Verse 7, and he's describing them further, these who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless. And they turn aside the way of the humble. That's not right. And a man, oh, I don't even want to read this next phrase. Because it's just offensive. A man and his father have the same girl. Step out, because it's going to get bad, he says. This is going to be bad. In order to profane my holy name? And then they go on. He describes them more. And on garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. So if you remember, when we went through the law, a man could give his, his coat, his cloak, as a pledge. Now, a man had one cloak. That's all he could afford. And if you gave your coat, your cloak, as a pledge, it was a huge pledge. I mean, it was a, that was a, a huge down payment to say, you're going to get it back. So whatever, you know, you borrowed, uh, whatever, here's my, here's my cloak, 
it's my pledge, you'll get it back, whatever it was. And so he says, here's what they did. They, they took the, the, the garment taken as a pledge and they stretched it out beside every uh, sexual altar and they had sex on it. He said, God's saying, you want to know why I'm offended? I'm just going to make sure you know this is not God's heart at all. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those they find. So they, they take the wine and they, then they take advantage. Yet it was I. Right. Now, verse 9 is interesting. The next few verses. He says, I'll summarize the next few verses. If you could only have understood and remembered how I blessed you. If you could only remember how I blessed you, you wouldn't have that attitude. He goes on. He describes, don't you remember? It was I who destroyed the Amorite. Before them, they were, they were, though his height was like the highest of cedar, highest of cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his root below, and it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Miracles. Don't you remember all the miracles? And I led you in the wilderness for 40 years. Don't you remember that? That you might take possession of the land of the Amorite. And then I raised up some of your sons for prophets. I raised up people within you that have got a heart after God. And some of your young men I raised up to be Nazarites. Is this not so, O sons of Israel? Is this not so? Don't you remember? What's a Nazarite, by the way? A Nazarite was a man who would be really dedicated to the Lord. He would say, I want to set my life apart for the Lord. Now, it could be for a period of time or it could be for a life. But he would like not drink alcohol of any kind, not even... Uh, not even eat grapes or raisins. He was like totally dedicated, not shave his, uh, uh, not cut his hair, that sort of thing. He is like dedicated to the Lord with his Nazarite vow. And he said, you know, I'm going to raise up people among you that just have a wonderful, special love. And I'm going to raise up uh, some of your sons to be prophets. And they're going to have the Holy Spirit. And they're just going to have a special anointing. And this is me. I poured it all out on you. Don't you remember all I did? Now see, this is really good because we need that perspective of remembering, to be thankful. There's another theme that runs throughout the Bible, and that theme is thankfulness. Are you thankful? Do you remember what God did for you? See, if we would be thankful, well, you know what it does? It humbles the heart. Thankfulness humbles the heart, which is really important because pride is what messes us up. Hum humility is the answer. We need humble hearts. And the way you get a humble heart is when you remember how God did what we could never have done for ourselves. I mean, if it wasn't for God taking hold of my life, I would have been so messed up. I, I, I would have been just so messed up that I don't even want to think about it. Anybody else in this room would say, if God got, didn't get a hold of my life, I would have been completely messed up. And see, it's important to say, you know what, God? I got to remember that. I got to remember that. You blessed me. You took hold of my life when I didn't deserve any of it. You helped me get out of that mud, that miry mess of a life that I had. You helped me get out of it. You set my feet on a rock. You loved me. You put your arms around me. You, you, you brought me. You gave me forgiveness. You gave me grace. And then you ordered my life and my steps and you ordered my way and you rebuilt my life after I destroyed it. God, I, I got to just stop and thank you for every bit of it. That changes your perspective. It gives you humility. And we need humility because when we start thinking that we're all that, and we did it on our own, and aren't I smart, and don't you, don't you back talk me because I got some real power. We're in trouble. And so this is what he's saying. Don't you remember what I did for you? You couldn't have done any of that. I did it all. Verse 12, but you made the Nazarites drink wine. Why did you do that? You commanded the prophet saying, stop it. I don't want to hear any of this prophecy. They didn't want to hear from Jeremiah. They threw him in a pit. Jeremiah got so frustrated at these people. He said, I'm, a, I'm done. I'm just done speaking the word of God. I can't stand it anymore. These people don't have an ear to hear. I'm done. I'm finished with it. And then he said, and when I shut my mouth, 
the words of God started burning in my bones. I had to open my mouth. I had to speak the word of God because they were like fire inside of me. But see, the problem, he says, no, I raised up special people, a special anointing, and you told them, stop it. We don't want to hear that. And there's some great, really some interesting examples. Verse 13 is a picture. He's using a little word picture here. He says, behold, I am weighted down beneath you as a wagon is weighted down when filled with sheaves. All right, imagine a donkey. Imagine a donkey that's carrying a cart. And this cart is so loaded with sheaves that it's, you know, maybe you've seen, if, if you're ever in the Middle East, it's like something you, you might imagine. This pile of sheaves, right? And this little donkey, you can barely even see the donkey because the sheaves are everywhere, you know? And it's kind of like that. He's saying, you know what? This is the thing. Picture this in your mind. All of your sins and your corruption and all that desp despicable stuff, it's like a load of sheaves. Weighted down, like a wagon is weighted down. Verse 14. So he says, Look, the flight will perish from the swift. In other words, you're not going to escape it, he's saying to them. You're not going to escape it. I don't care if you're a fast runner, you're swift, too bad. You're not going to escape it. And the stalwart will not strengthen his power, nor the mighty man will save his life. He who grasps the bow will not stand his ground, the swift of foot will not escape, nor will he who rides the horse save his life. Even the bravest among the warriors will flee naked in that day, declares the Lord. In other words, the word is sure. What God says is sure. No matter how smart or clever or fast or strong, it doesn't matter. The word of God is sure. Chapter 3. Hear this word, which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. You alone have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Start with that. Would you realize what I've done? I've chosen you out of all the families, of all the nations, I've chosen you. Membership has its privileges, you might say. I've chosen you amongst all the families of the earth. I've given you the promises and the covenants and the prophets and the temple, the presence of God, the, the Shekinah glory, the Messiah for the whole earth is going to come from you. The entire earth will be blessed because of you. But therefore, he says, I will punish you for your iniquities. In other words, membership has its privileges, but it also has its responsibilities. When God places his name, he says, I place my name on this nation. Therefore, that nation is mine. I place my name on that city of Jerusalem. That city is mine. I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me. This is one of the, the statements over and over that God uses, his heart. I want to be a father to you, and you be sons and daughters to me. I want to have this understanding that we're going to walk together. In fact, he goes on in verse 3 and following. He uses a series of questions, the rhetorical questions. And he's leading up to a great point. Do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? I think it's better said, do two men walk together unless they have an agreement? No, that's why they walk together, because they have an agreement. And it's a great phrase. What's he saying? You have an agreement with God. You have a covenant. Two men are to walk together. You have an agreement. You're supposed to be walking with God arm in arm. You have a covenant. Can two walk together unless they have an agreement? Well, we're walking together because we have an agreement. That's what he's saying. And by the way, it's a great picture. It's a great picture for us. We have an agreement. We have a better covenant than Israel had. Remember that? They had, a, they had the covenants. We have a better covenant. We have the best covenant there could possibly be. The new covenant based on the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we're walking, to get, that's why Jesus died on the cross, that we might have a way to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So now we have this relationship so that we can walk arm in arm with the Lord, you might say, and have relationship. When you get finished on this earth and you breathe your last, you're just going to keep on walking. 
because you're in the presence of the Lord from here to eternity. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have eternal life right now. Right now, you have eternal life. That's what Jesus said. I am the resurrection and the life. You have life now. So he says, this is applying to us because we have the better covenant. Verse four, does a lion roar in the forest when he doesn't have any prey? Well, no. No, a lion doesn't roar in the forest when he doesn't have any prey. Right, so does a lion roaring in the forest, guess what? That's his point. Oh, he must have some prey. In other words, God's gonna do it because God said he's gonna do it. He goes on, does a young lion growl from his den unless he's captured something? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there's no bait in it? Okay, now, this, I, I gotta love this because this is like a, a, a good preacher like pounding his point. Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there's no bait in it? Well, no. Well, guess what? There's bait in it, and the bird's falling into the trap. Does a trap spring up from the earth when it captures nothing at all? No. But there's something in it. If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? Of course they will. If calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. That's why he says in verse 8, a lion has roared. I, I love that. He builds up this point. Boom, boom. Pounding the point, you know. There's a lion roaring. Unless he's got to pray. There's a bird falling into the trap. You know, on and on. Then in verse 8, a lion has roared. Get it? <laughs> well, you have to be a pastor to really appreciate that. <laughs> Who will not fear? The lion has roared. The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Proclaim on the citadels in Ashdod. That's in Gaza. And on the citadels in the land of Egypt and say this. Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and watch and see the great tumults within her and the oppressions in her midst. Because they don't know how to do what's right. What's he saying? I want you to do what's right, man. See, I'm a, I bless your life. I poured out my spirit. I've done all these things, and it should have an impact on your life. I want you to live right. I'll help you. I'll help you. You know what? We'll do it together. We'll walk arm in arm through this life, and we'll do it together. And your life will be changed because we're going to do it together. That's what he's saying. I want you to do what's right. But these people, these people, they hoard up violence and devastation <clears throat> in their citadels. Verse 11, therefore, thus says the Lord God, an enemy, even one surrounding the land, will pull down your strength from you and your citadels will be looted. And he's talking of Assyria here. Thus says the Lord, just as the shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or a piece of an ear, so the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria will be snatched away and there won't be much left but the corner of a bed, the corner of a couch. Here, testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts. For on that day that I punish Israel's transgressions, I will also punish those altars of Bethel and the horns of the altar, that golden calf. He said the horns are gonna be cut off. Imagine a saw just cutting off the horns of the altar. Horns, you might remember, picture authority. And he says, you know what? Here's what I think about your golden calf in Bethel. I'm going to take a saw and just cut off its horns. And they're going to fall to the ground. And I'll smite the winter house together with the summer house. Oh, they have a summer house. And they got a winter house. Oh, how nice. And a house of ivory. Wow. You got a summer house, a winter house, an ivory house. He says, the great houses are going to come to an end. We live in a day of material prosperity and spiritual bankrupt. We are called, the scripture says, to be rich toward God. I love that phrase. Be rich toward God. Not just because it's my name, because it's a great, it's a great picture. Be wealthy, be rich, be spiritually wealthy. 
Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, wouldn't you love that? You know, we want material things, want to have the latest iPhone 6 Plus, because it's bigger. Those things are cool. I love those things. But he said, if you have material things, but you're spiritually bankrupt, you're really not doing very well. But if you can be spiritually wealthy, wouldn't you love to be spiritually wealthy? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, which just encourages our soul and ignites us, draws us to yourself, giving us a, a, a picture, an image of how much you love us and what you want to do to bless us. And God, I pray tonight that we here in this place would truly desire spiritual wealth, want to be spiritually wealthy. The world can concern itself with material things, I want, I'm concerning myself about spiritual things. I want to be spiritually wealthy. Is that your heart? Is that your desire? You're hungry for that? Thirsty for that? Would you just raise your hand and say, God, I am. I'm, I'm spiritually thirsty and hungry. I want to be spiritually wealthy. That's what I want. God, I desire your spirit in abundance, overflowing. God, pour out your life. I want to be spiritually wealthy. Father, thank you for everyone who says yes. Yes to you, Lord. I pray you'd answer every prayer. That sincere prayer that says, God, I want more of you, more of you. Spiritual wealth. Establish your name in my life, God. Pray for everyone who says that, that you'd answer that, and you'd meet them. Pour out your spirit of life, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everyone said.